Okay, thank you. All right, glad to be here. Well, before we get, oh, as we get started, uh, does anyone here work in sex addiction treatment? No? Okay. Uh -huh. uh, good. Uh, so we're, we're here, I'm, I'm here not, St. George Lee and I are not here to recruit patients. We do have patients for our practice. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to help you uh, to become, develop a, an interest. We, St. George Lee and I have been involved in this work for many, many years. Uh, but we're probably, maybe I bet you there are probably 10, doc ten, 10 doctors in, in, the, in the United States who do this work. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. Probably. And we, 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 both, yeah we, <laughs> both, we both belong to the Society for Advancement of Sexual Health, SASH. And we'll be touting that today because if those of you who want to get involved, then you want to get connected with SASH and attend their annual conferences. And also network with other people within the state you know, who do work in sex addiction. Um, I notice there's very few men here. <laughs> How, put your hands up, men. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All the sex addicts didn't come in. That's you know, right. They didn't want, that's they, right. Why, why they want to come in here? Because we mainly deal with men, of course. You know, <laughs> women who have sexual issues more often tend to think of the problem as love addiction than, se even though it may be sex addiction, than, than sex addiction. But so, so ma ma mainly we treat as men. And uh, in, uh, I work in. Uh, Virginia Beach at Meridian Psychotherapy, and I have two other people working with me, Patty Smith and Kara Weed, who both work in sex addiction therapy. And St. George Lee is in? I have been, I'm in Newport News, where I have a private office just myself for um, sex addiction therapy. Yeah. Now, you want me to get background? Or yeah, go, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, go. I'm a sex addict in recovery myself. Um, I lost my job as a physician in 1996. Oh. Because of that, I went into a best thing I ever did in my life, go into recovery, which cost a lot of money, but it was, it was four months worth. And um, after the four months, I needed a local, <laughs> and I'm laughing, after those four months, I needed to follow up with a um, sex addiction therapist here, and I went to Mike. Mike was in Virginia Beach, I went over there, and after what two sessions i think <laughs> uh, put him to work <laughs> yeah after two sessions he said i'm going to form a group sex addiction group and i'd like you to be my co-therapist and i said i'm not a therapist <laughs> you know but um he got me into it and um i enjoyed it a lot didn't pay me anything because i wasn't i wasn't <laughs> i wasn't uh um licensed in the, the deal but anyway after a while um i told mike actually actually the seventh no after the second visit when i came back i think mm -hmm. he said i'm going to set up a sex addiction therapy group he said i would like you as my co-therapist and i said i'm not a therapist well he sucked me in i did we did it for quite eight, a while eight years yeah <laughs> and uh most groups that have two therapists have a good, you know, a easy therapist and a harder therapist. Well, I was the harder one because I knew what these guys were up to, and girls too, as well. Um, so we practiced together for um, doing that for eight years, and towards the end of that time, he said, "I said, Mike, you know, tell me what you did and what you wish you had done if you'd become, you know, a, a sex addiction therapist." And he told me everything, and he said the one thing he didn't do, and I'm blanking on it now, was, oh, let's get a master's in, in uh, psychology or yeah. something along those lines. Yeah. And so I went and got a master's in psychology. Uh, and in 2003, I was, came out of addiction therapy in two, 1996. I don't think it was until 2003 that I, I wrote a book after that which is all about my addiction and then all about stuff for recovery. And then um, I uh, set up my own office and uh, after getting a, a master's in psychology, uh, psychiatry in psychology and then went to um, set up my own office in Newport News on J. Clyde Morris Boulevard where I see uh, clients along with, as, as Mike does too mm -hmm. as well. I have a uh, I'll just tell you a little brief stuff about that. I had up to 14 clients at one time. I had a gr 
of those, nine of them were in a group. So I had a both individual and group therapy. And I, but I don't take insurance. The recession hit. I went down to one client every other week. Uh, and I'm now up to six. And, um, you know, I, I, I do a sliding scale as to what I charge them based on their income or what they say their income is. It's not always exactly right, but <laughs> as you might expect. But um, so that's what I've been doing ever since. And I really love the work. I've, I've worked on sex addiction females and males. The sickest person I ever saw briefly was a female, a 23-year-old female. She had, she was a cute little girl. I mean, she was short, not girl. She's 23 years old. And um, it turns out she had never known anybody, male or female, who she hadn't had sex with. Well, on her third visit to me, she came in all dressed up with a low-cut dress. <laughs> and, um, you know, I didn't, didn't go for that. <laughs> and she never turned up again. I feel really, she was really one sick person who I'm sure was badly abused in her had to have been in her childhood. We just never, mm -hmm. she never came out with all that mm -hmm. in the three sessions she had. Mm -hmm. And after I didn't go for her, uh, <laughs> come on, um, uh, she didn't come back. And I, ha I haven't seen any women since. I do see the wives of sex addicts. I'll see them either individually. Mostly though, I see them with, um, with their husband on one visit. Occasionally, more than one, but that's it. Okay. Mike? Well, um, now we, we have a series of slides. Now, these slides, we're not going to be rushing through any slides. This is all, our program is all interactive. Uh, so we'd like to hear from you and about the, the topics that we, that we bring up. Um, let's see. This is, okay, diagnosis. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, Sex addiction not listen to DSM-5. Um, in our practice, we tend to use, almost everyone has PTSD or depression, dysthymia. We use those diagnoses for billing. But then also they have the diagnosis of sexual disorder, NOS, usually. Or unless they have a specific, the DSM uh, has some special, special uh, some certain uh, addiction listed like exhibitionism, voyeurism, fraudulism. Sometimes if they're, they're listed, then we'll use those. So it says here, that what this is all about, this slide is about in, 2000, in, in the ICD-11, ICD which will be coming out next year, um, the diagnosis of compulsive sexual behavior will appear. And the uh, criteria for that diagnosis is the same as for sex addiction. Now, Sex addiction is not a, the addiction term is not favored in mm. many psychological cir mm. circles uh, because they see it's more of a lay, layman's term. Uh, so, and, and like, uh, so, so uh, the terminology compulsive sexual behavior probably will be our new terminology. <clears throat> but one thing about sex addiction, the terminology, uh, it applies to Sex Addicts Anonymous and where we refer our patients to, a 12-step program for recovery from sex, sexual addiction. Uh, and and that, that, that is a very uh, useful uh, terminology for people to hang their hat on, you know, the word, the term, term addiction. Um, so the, uh, the next, uh, there we go, okay. Now this is the definition. This is a definition uh, that appears from SAS, Society of Advancement of Sexual Health, a persistent and escalating pattern or patterns of sexual behaviors acted out despite increasingly negative consequences to self and others. So um, sure. Not all sexual victimizers are addicts. I mean, there are uh, some types of sexual victimization may take place, but it's just not progressive. If it's progressive, it continues to cause problems, then it fits in the addictive pattern. But if somebody has a, one, a, a single episode of, of some impropriety, that may not, doesn't mean they may not need help and need treatment, but they probably wouldn't be recommended for sex addiction therapy because they have to have a number of consequences before they do. Um, so uh, I said here, no one in the audience needs any reminders of the enormous problem our society faces with sexual victimization. 
And of course, what's going on now, as you all know, is the Me, is the, uh, Me Too movement, uh, which is uh, uh, heightening our awareness of sexual uh, victimization. Um, and, uh, and we'll get into that in some detail here today. The, uh, we used to be called our organization National Council on Sexual Addiction, but with the uh, broadening of our interest in other types of victimization, then we changed our name to the Society for Advancement of Sexual Health, SASH, S-A-S-H. We have annual meetings. Um, uh, we have uh, had just had our national conference at the Founders Inn in uh, Virginia Beach this past mm -hmm. uh, October. So the next one uh, is October 2nd and 3rd in St. Louis. Uh, if, if you all, if you all, if you all get inspired by our meeting here today, <laughs> to go ahead and join up. St. Louis <laughs> okay. is a nice town. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, this is the victimization of partners, a societal <coughs> continuum, uh, and this is, fits into what I was just talking about, is uh, not necessarily progressive, but may include, th these are uh, victimization patterns, sexual obje ob objectifying, emotional affairs, grooming, suggestive remarks, uh, in touch, coercive control, gaslighting, stalking, these, these, are, these are a pattern, and I have it as a progressive pattern. Starting off here with, with uh, um, objectification, ending up with lust murder. Now, uh, I'll start with the back and move forward. The lust murderers, um, Gerald Blanchard in our group, uh, a counselor in um, Wyoming, studies lust murderers, and he's interviewed 60 of them. And almost everyone had sex with their mothers. Hmm. Powerful, you know, what a powerful uh, influence in one's, in one's behavior to create, to create a person who, who turns into a lust murderer. One thing I want to mention is that the internet has increased sexual addiction about eightfold. Yeah, that's right. Right. Now, um, murder-suicide. My wife plays tennis at the tennis club in Norfolk. One of her partners in playing tennis was killed by her husband. He uh, was retired Navy captain, and he was being disciplined by the Navy for the tail hook scandal. Do you know about the tail hook scandal? It has to do with Navy flyers gathering in Las Vegas every year or so to have a get together where they're talking. But a lot of it's all sex and drugs and <laughs> and, and, and and alcohol, I guess. But. Uh, he was disciplined for because of because it was unruly and victimization victimized women. He uh, then was disciplined by the Navy, and then I, he I guess never really had a had a very happy home life. Most of our patients, of course, who are involved in sexual compulsion, do not are not able to have normal sex or sex and sex and marriage, and we'll 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 talk about that as we go on. So um, he his wife got a restraining order on him. And he ended up violating restraining order, killing her and kill, killing her and killing himself. But so I don't know how, you know, you read about these cases in the paper and it's almost, uh, they're not so infrequent. Uh, that the BJ is not far from where I live. The, the, um, a man waited for his wife to come out of the store and killed him and killed, him, killed her and killed himself. So there's a lot of this going on, uh, unfortunately. But uh, uh, the, the, the power, of course, of this, a lot of this begins in childhood. You know, just we, we talked about having sex with mothers. Yes? Well, before I forget, um, I'm thinking the lust murders. I didn't realize there was such, you know, a high number that actually had sex with their mothers, which I'm sure was probably forced. And I'm old, I was trained in the old Freudian stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, is this like such a severe emotional trauma or does it become physiological, like incest is goes against nature? I mean, to do because of that relationship with the mother that they would kill people. You know, almost like the psycho movie a little bit. You know, they would kill the mother. Do you, do, you, do you look at Freud when you're looking at some of these serious cases? Yeah, well, these serious cases, uh -huh. you said physiological. Well, they, they, these cases do. Uh, end up in um, emotional and, phys and physical, physiological uh, things. Uh, the, 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 the issue, uh, some of the issues relating to uh, childhood trauma, we see it all the time. I'll give you a little example. A patient uh, comes to us 
He's uh, 32 years old, and uh, he's lived most of his life at home with his parents. He uh, was tend to be isolated, uh, and he uh, f happened to meet a lady and uh, fell in love, and they got married. And uh, the and they got at the marriage. The mother made a total ass of herself. <laughs> she uh, completely destroyed the wedding, being attacking the parents, the, the lady, the, the the bride's parents, <laughs> uh, in public, you know, uh, over some slights. And all I think has to do with the wounding she was getting because her. I don't think he, she, and her son had sex, but that they were p paired off in an emotional way. It's called emotional incest. And this is, we see that frequently. I have two patients now who, uh, who in, with marital discord, ended up moving back with their mothers. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, they're not able to develop healthy relationships. The issue for, for us in dealing with sex addiction is not only not acting out sexually, but developing healthy intimacy in marriage. Because, or relationships, because that's missing. Like, so I saw to our patients when they come, your goal, no sexual acting out and healthy intimacy and relationship. So the, 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 these, these, these are, these are the, uh, the things we're, we, you know, we're, we'd be looking for. Uh, we can't do a lot of work on the intimacy early on. Uh, you probably find the same, but after, after, after a period of time when they get a handle on their recovery, uh, then, then we can start working on intimacy. And by the way, during our break, up here, all, I brought all my books. <laughs> well, all the books that pertain to the topic that are important, there's a couple missing. But uh, you can come up and look them over. Also, over there, I have uh, papers, I have uh, pamphlets from SAA and COSA. Do you know what COSA is? COSA, Codependence on Sex Addicts. <laughs> so uh, you have a, they have a meeting here on Tuesday night at, uh, still going on? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I, just, <laughs> I know the one in New, in Hampton, with the, which my wife was in until a year ago. Oh, really? Okay. Even though I'd stop and say, hey, yeah. long before that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and she stopped. And the amazing thing, I'm just going to say one thing about my marriage. My wife, while I was in treatment, wrote me and said she wanted a divorce. And then, um, I came home to see a daughter I hadn't seen in quite a while because she'd been overseas for a semester of school, of uh, college, and um, went and saw her, and I went to see my wife. Then I just sat down with my wife for a minute and reached over and put her hair in my <laughs> hand in my hair, and that was the beginning of getting back together. And um, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary Yay. this month. <laughs> That's great. I agree with you. Yay! <laughs> I think most of the people that we see who get involved in the recovery process get better. But we, we most of the, yeah, you, go, you had a question? I just wanted to ask about the COSA. I, I think I am familiar with one in Virginia Beach or Hampton, but yeah. is there one locally you're saying? And over, oh, over in Virginia Beach? It, here in Williamsburg? No, is I don't think Virginia? so. Okay. Uh -huh, yeah. there's, there's the one on Tuesday night at, in uh, Hampton, and then. No, I, I, was when, when Ann left, I think. It broke up. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So <laughs> maybe it's in, not being held. And that was last year. I'm not sure, but yeah. I'm pretty sure of yeah. that. Okay. I haven't been there to yeah. see, you know, so. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> if I find out about it, I'll somehow get the word to you all, but I don't think it's still running. So what we just talked a little bit about was trauma bonding, how the, the, the boy becomes trauma bound to the mother and how that plays itself out in the adult life. And what happens is what's called developmental delay. And you know who writes about this is uh, Charles Whitfield. You may have know that book, Healing the Child Within, because Great he book. talks about, about the, uh, uh, he calls the development of the false self. The false self is, 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 is the one who's been uh, uh, co-opted by, by the uh, parent. Another example would be a child who's like 10 years old, father's a sex addict, he, they, her parents split up. He then becomes uh, very close to his mother, watching TV in bed at night with the mother, and then he goes off to bed. But stuff like that, a very close relationship. And then what happens is the parents get back together again. <laughs> and, that, 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 and that spoils the mother-child <laughs> relationship. 
not that it was sexual, but that, but that, that pairing off uh, can, can uh, if, if, if it's not interrupted, could be, can, be, can be very destructive. Yes? Do you see children? Do either of you see children? Uh, well, I tell you, I had a, a boy uh, 16 years old recently, and he was involved in what happened to him. He was uh, raped as a child over and over again uh, with uh, uh, anal intercourse. And uh, this was at age seven, eight, nine. And then he uh, developed the inability to, to have an evacuation, to have a stool, unless it was uh, manipulated. He had to manipulate the, per the production of the stool. Uh, uh, then this, this uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, progressed to the point where he got anal injuries and scarring. Of course, didn't, go, didn't tell anybody, you know. And then uh, he came to us. And what happened to him is that he, I said, referred him to King's Daughters Hospital to see the gastroenterologist. And they uh, helped him so he could develop a normal bowel habit without manipulation. But then he stopped coming. <laughs> Once that happened, when he didn't need any help, he stopped coming. But the, so the real big problems were never, never, were never, de never really dealt with. He had a very destructive relationship with his mother too. So, I have, I have not had kids. The 23-year-old was yeah, the youngest. So the youngest I you had. have, yeah. Yes. I used to work in a prison in Illinois, and I recall we had um, quite a few inmates, male inmates, who killed their mothers. Uh huh. Um, do you think that's that, that could be? I don't know enough about the study. You know, the study of that. Going back to talking about the uh, uh, dust murders. Um, or, or what you're talking, killing their mothers. Uh, you know the the slang term "motherfucker." Now, when you, I mean, that's slang used term. so casually, uh, and uh, in 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 uh, speech, and and this casual use doesn't really take into account the seriousness of the. Uh, it's sort of symbolic, but look what look what the problem is. That they were they, they, that many of these people, if they had, did have sex with their mothers, and then have the mothers being 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 dead, you know, that's this is we're talking about a really serious problem. So we're not here. I'm not here, and I know Saint's not here to try to change the language of people. But now we're just I've just t take a look at the meaning of it. I used to be on the World Board of Trustees of Narcotics Anonymous and traveled all over the world with NA, and I hear motherfucker a lot. <laughs> 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 at the meetings, you know. And so you I, say it all the time, right? <laughs> right. That's right. And, uh, and I go swimming at the Navy gym at the, and the pool in the Portsmouth and sir again. So, but, but again, I don't think that that, this, we're, oh, I'll tell you, might as well talk about it right now. Uh, this is called, uh, I have it written down here. You might not read it. It's called eroticized rage. This is word using the f fuck this and fuck that as you know in association with angry remarks, as for you know all for emphasis is uh, is uh, using erotic. Or how many other erotic terms? Son of a bitch, a bastard. All you know all these words have to do with sex in a way, and uh, with sexual wounding. You know, so uh, but this 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 is uh, this the, the, the uh, when you use the word fuck, then that means you're really serious about it. You know. <laughs> it's fucking this. Not fucking today. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, so, it's so language, uh, unfortunately. Now, when you go more all go more. home tonight, and your and your partners will say, "What'd you talk about today?" <laughs> so, but 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 I'm I'm not talking about uh, we're we're trying just like the Me Too movement now is expanding our horizons and expanding our understanding of, of victimization of women. So this is another issue here. The other thing that's going on here too. That's uh, called rise size rage. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, anyway, where are we now? Okay, now we're going, going to get back to our slides again. Uh, the, uh, oh yeah, all, all, uh, all assessments need to be prefaced with a comment. Anything the patient tells the counselor sounds like illegal behavior. The counselor needs to inform, so, and the, I tell the patient to come in. If you tell me something with our by, I su suspect that you may be uh, victimizing someone, uh, w and which would be against the law, uh, like pedophilia or you know any other kind of a, a, of a sexual crime. 
then I'm obliged to call the police or talk, talk to social services. So the, you all, when you're all, you yourselves are doing histories and you encounter people in your practice who may have sexual compulsions, then you need to do this. What we're seeing a lot of these days is, uh, Peter, is uh, internet porn uh, and, and uh, looking at uh, child, child porn, child porn. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the crime of child porn is punished even more severely than pedophilia. <laughs> the, the, uh, we see two patients we had recently both sentenced to 13-year prison sentences for looking at child porn. But uh, more than that, I think there's a lot of sharing of child porn. The sharing, internet sharing, is where they really, uh, where, uh, as they really get into trouble. Yeah. I had one client who <clears throat> felt prone to that, and what he, what he had was a, 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 something on the internet that was discovered, all kinds of naked women, and, and one or two kids. And uh, he was charged with ch child pornography because of that. So Even just, though he wasn't specially interested. No, and he was put in jail yeah. uh, for two years, yeah. and he got out on probation. Yeah. And I saw him when he was on probation. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Who just um, anyway. Consequences, progressive and predictable. <laughs> uh, you know, with all addiction, uh, the consequences are predictable. That is, tolerance and dependence applies to all addiction, applies to sex addiction. A uh, person who's an alcoholic, who ends up getting, oh, a little bit of an example, a man I knew had eight DUIs over many years, okay? So he stayed sober for eight years, and last October he had a drink. What happened? Got, got of course. <laughs> and so, 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 you know, he says, how'd you know? I said, well, how could I? I mean, I'm a fortune teller. So, you know, you know shh. We're all, all, we're all, we're all can be fortune tellers because people pick up with the, with, they pick up with the same patterns that they left, you know, with the same thing with sex addiction, to pick on the same. <clears throat> Often family and friends minimize consequences, believe the addict's promises. When blaming and minimizing stops, recovery can be possible. Then the consequences can be the instrument for change, you know, if they can really get in touch with the, with the consequences and break the denial. Now these are types of consequences in different areas. One's social uh, consequences, distance from loved ones, social organizations, emotional, anxiety. I guess the greatest one, emotional one, is <coughs> despair. Uh, and all, you know, all addiction, a, I say sex addiction is a parallels cocaine addiction. You know, it's an upper. <laughs> uh, so, uh, they, uh, but then again, you know, with cocaine, you stop cocaine, where are you? Down. Down. Same with. <laughs> Same with sex. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why depression and suicide. I've had two patients who are new to treatment commit suicide. They really hadn't had a chance to get their arms wrapped around the problem, you know. Uh, yeah, then yeah. The physical STDs, you must refer your people and their partners for STD and HIV evaluations, you know. Um, Legal, sexual, sexual, sexual like the restraining orders, arrest child, all the different legal consequences, social, financial rather, cost of affairs, lap dancing, all that prostitutes, massages, all cost money. Spiritual, then it's loneliness, resentment, self-blame, and self-pity. We're going to go into that in some detail. Now this is Dr. Carnes speaking. Dr. Carnes um, wrote the book called uh, The Sex Addiction in 1984. <laughs> I read it in 1988. Oh, it had that title to begin with, Sex Addiction. Yeah, and now, now he changed the title to Out of the Shadows. Somebody on an airplane told him that Sex Addiction, that's not too... But back then it was talk, talked about it, so this... He changed the title. Yeah, he title. changed the title. How I got involved in this is I had a patient who was alcoholic who was two years sober. And one day he called me, could I come in and see you? I said, come on in. He came in, he was full of anguish. I said, what's going on with you? He says, oh, it's something I haven't told you. You know, I moved here two years ago from Phoenix, but didn't tell you why I moved here. I said, what's that all about? He says, oh, I was involved in a fatal attraction romance. And my wife said that she, she would stick with me if we moved out of town. So I get a map of the United States, Norfolk, Virginia. She'll never find me there. Comes to Norfolk, gets a job in the shipyard, gets into AA, things seem to be going well. But on the day in which he came to see me when he's full of anguish, guess who, guess who moved in across the street? 
Ah. <laughs> Whoa, you know. So it just devastated them. You wait, know? wait, wait. They were divorced? No, no, no. They, 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 they too. They came. They both well, they came, came here. They came, they came together. Oh, yeah. and then one of the women. And 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 and, and, and one, his his affair partner right. from there surfaced. Jeez. Yeah. So so this is, it shows you the power the power of addiction. Fortunately, he got better. But then when that came that came, uh, he, oh, I no. saw him. I really didn't know what to do about this. So, but I'd read the, the book the the sex addiction. And then I saw advertisements for courses in sex addiction therapy at the University of Minnesota by Dr. Carnes. So that was 1991. So I went out there and studied with him. And we got to be good friends, and you are <laughs> friends with us too, uh, and, uh, and, and working on you know, de developing a treatment. He, but he's our pioneer, Dr. Carnes. And that is the book, Out of the Shadows. You need to have that in your library if you're going to be reading about this. And I suggest it to all our patients and their families. Because there's a chapter in here, chapter in here for He's the. He's good. Uh, He's also an egotistical maniac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, his writing is good. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, he changed it so you go into sex SAA uh, sex addiction meetings like yeah. we used to go. Yeah. It's no longer approved as. Oh, really? Towards his uh, oh. licensing, you know. Oh, yeah. They have these how grants. There's, there's, there is a certification. So he, he formed something else. Yeah. <laughs> it's called IIT. It's what you mentioned later in our slides. It's an it's um, international institute uh, for addiction and trauma, trauma professionals. Yeah. And this is uh, uh, where they give a, he gives a, I, I have a certification, and you don't have to do but, but, but this. It I, got, I got really. I called his office and gave him hell. Oh, I know. And of course, they love Dr. Carnes. So. Yeah. Well, the problem is that it's one person granting the certification, where yeah. we really need to have a national organization granting the certification. But anyway, uh, that's Which that's a have. little bit about that. Just now, this is the, 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 what as the Saint is just saying. What Carnes says is very val. It's quite valuable, and he's our pioneer. He's he, you know, he, he I call him the early messenger. You know, he's the early man got us going. And he's an addict in recovery, too. D right. Yeah. Okay, this addiction, fantasy and obsession, ritual, uh, uh, that, sort of. that is the rituals, what, what the addict goes through, like uh, somebody who's, who is maybe an exhibitionist will be planning where he's going to go to display himself, a gas station or someplace in public or whatever, a, a, a hotel lobby, you know, different places. The sex act, despair uh, and, and, and then the, the despair follows and then repeat. Of course, the despair gets worse. And, and it says tolerance reflected, is reflected more in fantasy and ritual. In other words, you see that the addiction grows more in your head than it does in actual fact. You know, there's only so much sex people can have, yeah. but, the, but the, so that happens, they'll spend hours and hours on the computer uh, or hours and hours in lap dancing and, uh, or whatever the places, that, the places they'll go. Uh, dependence is reflecting despair, and sensitization is uh, sensitization of the triggers are reflected in fantasy and ritual, uh, and that's the of course the most powerful part. Now, now there is a tolerance, dependence, and sensitization. Now these are the key factors you, we, we all need to know about to understand addiction, because these are the common denominators for all addiction: tolerance, increasing use over time, dependence is withdrawal effect, and sensitization of the triggers. What do you think is the most powerful one of three in sustaining addiction? What? I would say sensitization. Sensi sensitization. Yes, without a doubt. That's that, that, the, the triggers are the, mo are the most, most powerful, power, powerful figures. And of course, that leads to our patients with computers, you know, because the computers are sensitized. They're anointed, you know, holy a computer, you know. So that while we work with our patients, we have to work on separating them from their computers. Which is hard to do because uh, yeah. they uh, uh, may need the computers for their work. Mm -hmm. uh, then we use what's called bookending. <laughs> I wrote it here, I think. No, I didn't. Yeah, bookending. You can't see it though. Bookend. Well, bookending means this is a recovery tool. This is where it's a person who's in SAA and has to use the computer for work. Before he turns it on, he calls an SAA member. When he finishes using the computer, he calls an SAA member. He calls it, you know, back and forth. I had a sponsee in, in SAA who um, sent me, because he had computer problems yeah. with sex, sent me um, his line of all the websites he'd been to every week. 
so as to keep him off, that it would help him be keep off um, the, the sexual stuff for, for, accountab for accountability. Yeah, for accountability. Yeah, right, right. right. And he he was pretty accountable when yeah. I got those things every week. It was amazing. <laughs> also, if, as far as accountability goes, oftentimes we make, recommend a uh, filter called Covenant Eyes. Mm -hmm. And that is a one they can apply to their phone, but they need have an uh, have their uh, sponsor or yeah, that's what that's what I did. We, did we did used. that yeah, yeah. A, a sponsor or therapist or family member to be uh, the person who's responsible for check you know checking on it. Is better a sponsor problem? than a family member. Yeah, but better right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we try to keep the families out if possible because so often uh, their codependency makes them really eager to, to, to monitor their uh, addict, you know. I uh, put it right here, just, there's not much, we don't need to go through that again. I told you that already about the connections between that and drug addiction. As far as, uh, yes, please. What, what's the definition of book ending? Of what? Book ending. Book ending is, you, you start, okay. The book, like if you have two book ends and your book's in the middle, so what you're doing when you are using the computer, you call somebody, your first bookend, then the books, you work on the computer, then when you finish the computer, you call the person again. In other words, you're calling someone in SAA before you use the computer and after you use the computer to be accountable. Yeah. Yes? You keep mentioning SAA. Is there one around this? Yes, there's meetings here in Virginia Beach, uh, I'm sorry, here, here in Williamsburg, they're in throughout Tidewater, they're throughout the United States. Not only is SAA, but they also have SA, which is Sexaholics Anonymous. Sexaholics, okay, each recovery group, and we can talk yeah, about this a little more. three or four more. different ones, yeah. Yeah, the, the, for SAA, uh, everyone uh, has to establish their bottom lines, you know, wh whereby they won't be, which, which they won't be doing, you know. In SA, Sexaholics Anonymous, everybody has the same bottom line, which is no sex with self or others outside of marriage. No sex with self or others outside of marriage, which means it pretty much exclu excludes people who are, who are not married but, or who also are gay. But SAA doesn't have that. In SAA, everyone establishes their own bottom lines, and we'll go over that with you in a little bit more detail a little later. Okay. Uh, now, Arousal template. This is this is something um, that uh, we talk, we alluded to already. Uh, terms of Car Dr. Carnes and Dr. Money. Now here's Carnes, and this is this is Dr. Money. <laughs> That's the call, book called Love Maps. The, these the, this these two books are very important. Now out of the shadows in this. Now, Dr. Money says we have what we call an arousal template. That's how we're going to experience uh, orgasm in our adult life. And with the sex addict, the, uh, the uh, love map has been vandalized. Dr. Carnes uses this terminology, arousal template, to apply to the same thing. Arousal template and uh, love map all apply to the same thing. It has to do with how the uh, person, and, and Dr. Money says, that the, uh, our love maps um, develop mainly between ages five and eight. And, but they can be vandalized, you know, by, uh, <coughs> sex, by, by sexual um, uh, shaming because of doctor-nurse games and things like that, uh, <coughs> where, the, where the parents would go overboard and shaming the child because of something which is, tends to be normal for children. <clears throat> or else the child can be sexually molested. <clears throat> and in cases like that, it's quite, quite severe. And we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about that in, uh, in future slides here. So uh, <clears throat> the, I think that covers it pretty well, van van <clears throat> about vandalization taking place in the younger life. Uh <clears throat> I, I tell you, there's a, a doctor, a friend of mine, who's a, a, an endocrinologist in Portsmouth. And he's a holistic guy. And uh, I had a patient, he referred to me, and uh, the patient wasn't doing well, and I called to tell him. He says, you know, Mike, he says addiction. Addiction's a phase on the path to recovery. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so in other words, in other words, when we're dealing with our patients with addiction, and you all, the people in Williamsburg Place know, know this, that we have, we, have, we have to deal with the addiction, but we also have to look what happened before 
and what's going on now as far as the trauma issues, you know. So, so we, we cause, cause, uh, and I think in our practice too, we're, we're, we're keen on that as, is dealing with the trauma issues as well. <coughs> so um, to, to, uh, <coughs> to deal with that, okay. <coughs> now, now this is, this is distorted expressions of sex. These are the, <coughs> these are our main categories, hyposexuality, which would be like sexual anorexia, <coughs> which we, this is a Karn's book on that topic, which is good. Sexual anorexia is people who abhor sex, you know, <coughs> or, 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 uh, and, and avoid sex. <coughs> the um, hyposexual, but it's, but the, okay. This is called, uh, we talk uh, called acting in and acting out. Acting in is, is hyposexuality, acting out is hypersexuality. So if a person's acting out, they're having a lot of sex. Acting in, they're not having any sex. These are the terminology we use to refer to people that. Paraphilia is, uh, <coughs> all, all has, has to do with these special expressions of sex in adult life, which has been related to childhood trauma. And we're going to go through a whole list of that in uh, just a moment. Um, I said about the acting out and acting in is listed there. Okay, now these are these are six. I'll go through this quickly. These are these are classes of paraphilias and ask questions if you like as we go along. <clears throat> Some of these ca ca cases are, ki are quite extreme and we don't necessarily need to run into them. But occasionally we do. Uh, Some of them die uh, for one thing. Oh <laughs> yeah, yes, they right. die for something like this: paraphilic yeah. strangulation or asphyxiation, and snuffing. Do you know about it? What is it? Anybody encounter it? You're talking about like snuff films where they try and they, it's, they basically kill their person through sexual activity or during sexual activity. And they kill them how? Through asphyxiation. The asphyxiation. Yeah. Well, if asphyxiation, the, the, uh, the hypo, hypoxia can, and, and, uh, can heighten the orgasm. <laughs> So oftentimes that that uh, just don't get too much of it, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So some well. some suicides were actually a paraphilic uh, asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. Another type is paraphilic electrocution, which is where they le use electricity in some way or another to heighten the organism, orgasm, and that sometimes results in them not you know to, to killing themselves. Collusional atonement, where hustlers invited to beat the orga individual to orgasm occurs. And I've had a couple of patients like that who, uh, both gay, who got involved with, with the groups and they, they, they would be beaten up by them, which, uh, which in, in turn heightened their orgasm, you know. Uh, you know, one thing about sex addiction, our patients have something to disgust everyone <laughs> or anyone. Because they're not, they're, these are not often not these are not such pleasant topics to deal with, but uh, I, but this what we're talking about here now helps to give us some understanding of the origins of these problems. The sadomasochistic repertoire. Now, not everyone is involved in sadomasochistic sex is an addict. I mean, if no one's being hurt, and that's something they do, there's something we don't get involved in. It's only when the sadomasochistic rep problem causes bodily harm or, 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 or an emotional at all harm uh, like that. So we do run into patients who have things like this. Next is coprophilia. That's sex with feces and urophilia. They call that water sports. <laughs> so I, I saw a license plate. Oh, it, did said, you? it said water sports on it. So we, you know, most people you see a thing water sports, you'll think about it's, you know, going to the uh, beach or something like yeah. that. But here it's different. So, uh, yes. Um, I'm not asking you to be graphic, but what do they do with um, electricity? Well, the electricity c c just uh, can give themselves like a shock or try to get a minor shock in association with some sexual sexual expression. Okay. Yeah. And what do you get too big a shock. Assessment to try to get at. <coughs> okay. You can write it down, right? It's called the, this is called the Sexual Dependency Inventory, SDI. It's authored by Dr. Carnes and David Delmonico and is available online. SDI, Sexual Dependency Inventory. It's exhaustive. It's about 27 pages to, to, uh, to, to, to study it. We, we use that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, another types of paraphilia, marauding and predation. This is marauding is paraphilic rape. Um, I don't see patients who are rapists, usually because uh, they, uh, you, you, you all end up in, most of them end up in jail and they don't, don't get any referral. Predation, stealth, this is, these are strange behaviors. Uh, kleptophilia, Dr. Karn, Dr. Money rather, has a name attached to all the paraphilias. Kleptophilia is stealing, is, is stealing things, like the sense of stealing of women's shoes or breaking into hope to steal vendors under. One of my patients we used to be on the subway in New York and steal women's shoes. Um, somnophilia, we've had patients like so that. People take the shoes off, I guess, they'll, they'll, while they'll, they're on the subway? They'll, well, they use a ruse, you know, to find some way to get them to, yeah. to uh, the way their movement or something like that to get the shoe Jeez. off. Oh, they use confusion. Uh, Fracturism is also, we'll talk about that too, that's where sex with rubbing against someone, and they'll, they, they, they orca this is all well orchestrated by these folks. Somnophilia, breaking into bedroom, often these people, uh, they're men again, somnophilic, they're often arrested for rape, but they're usually not rapists, but they're, they just want to masturbate in the presence of a sleeping woman. Necrophilia, of course, is very serious, that's the sex with dead. Sex of a dead body, hybristophilia, women who allies with a voracious predatory male like the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Have you, other, seen, you haven't seen all of these. Some, you? not some, all. No. Yeah, same uh, yeah. <laughs> the next is paraphilia, mercantile and venal. Venal has to do with uh, corruption, money. Uh, prostitution, which, where uh, orgasm is a commodity. Uh, we don't see many uh, prostitutes for treatment. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know why. I, I guess it's an area that we probably could be more involved in by working with, with social services and with police departments. Uh, purchase foam sex is a big deal. Big deal. Pa payment paraphilia, such as masturbating a strip show or lap dancing. Uh, payment by artifice, where a man poses a pimp, encouraging stranger to have sex with his wife. This is something I've seen a couple times too, where the the man has a, he becomes, his sexual uh, template is to have orgasm, masturbate in the presence of his wife having, or girlfriend having sex with another man. So that would be venal? Well, as money's involved, because they're paying him off. They, 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 uh, they pay, will pay someone to have sex with his, with his wife. Yeah. So really kind of a live, live, live session, live version of watching pornography. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because there was a case. Say again. What if money's not involved? Because I've heard of uh, somebody recently that the woman or the wife was kind of forced into her husband said, You will do this. The guy was willing. She really wasn't, but her, she was kind of forced into it. And her husband would sit and masturbate and watch that. But she really. So she was forced into it by her husband. So she wasn't a willing participant. Right, so, so this is a. Money. Yeah, this is, no, this is an extreme case of a coercive control. You know, we'll talk about that too, about, about uh, how spouses, a men get to co uh, you know, co coerce their wives into their <coughs> behavior, controlling who their friends are, controlling you know, all aspects of their life. Yeah. And other types of power, fetishes and talisman, masturbation with adult female clothing or child's underwear or diapers, all separate paraphilias into themselves. Um, now there's clismophilia. Now see, clismophilia, I had a patient who had, who had a clismophilia. What happened was uh, a counselor referred he and his wife to me, not necessarily for sex addiction, because he didn't know that that was the issue. He wanted me to refer them to a, a person I would think would be good for marriage counseling. So, but when they came in, and I first thing I said, well, why are you here? And the wife says, oh, I'm here because my wife wants, my husband wants to involve an enema in our sexual repertoire. And I find it disgusting. So the story is, he was a child of a, of a schizophrenic mother, lived in New Hampshire, a rural community, and every punishment involved an enema. Before you know it, at age 13, he's in the outhouse with an enema bag. And then, he, as an adult life, he can't have an orgasm unless he has an enema involved. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 but this, so this, this, this so he, he got into SAA and did real well, you know, and was able to distance himself from that. Transvestophilia, in which the female clothing, this is not such an uncommon issue, which no. is men dressing in women's clothing. Uh, the clothing is sexualized. And the issue there is not that they want to be a woman, they just are, they're, they're, they're sexually attracted to women, cl women's clothing. Uh, 
as a, and so as compared to a homosexual, a drag queen, uh, this is, they're, they're interested in the role, you know, the female role. And we don't, I've never treated anyone who was a male as a drag queen. I, I don't know enough about it. I know, yeah, we all know what it's all about, but, but we don't know, uh, I don't know enough about the uh, dynamics. And transsexual, of course, is role reversal. A person's transsexual is not a sex addict. That's, that has to do with role reversal, yeah. But when you see patients, and they are wearing man wearing women clothing, then you want to have to sort it out. Drag queen, uh, transvestite, or transsexual. You know, they're, 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 they have, you, have, you have to sort that, sort that out. More paraphilia, more paraphilia, bad body alter. This is rather dramatic. I've never seen it, but uh, the doctors tell us about it. This is somebody who is an amputee uh, who be, becomes a sex object for a person, or some people who have become amputated to become the sex object, you know, because they're, they're, they're addicted to that. So another side, this is, another, this is not just an uncommon thing that we see, is men who favor sex with women, excuse me, men who have sex with men with breasts. The men, their sex objects have breasts. Wait a minute, it's not that uncommon? Come on. No, believe me, I, we, we have our people in our group right now <laughs> who've, who've, had, who've had, had this, uh, this uh, that issue, you know. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's, you see how distorted uh, some, some of this is, but please don't be surprised when your patients tell you these things because that, 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 that uh, may, may prevent them from really being uh, uh, forward and telling you the whole story, you know. Um, chronophilia, this is very important, has to do with the role of, playing a, the role of an adolescent or a child. Okay. Playing the role of an adolescent or child, and, or else, uh, the other side of you, a pedophile. See, pedophiles usually have chronophilia as well. Chronophilia means their sexual, their sexual partners need to be a certain age. So, 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 say age could be you know, five to seven. And once that partner is eight, no longer, they no longer qualify. So, and I don't know enough about how it is that whereby the, 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 the this 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 uh, uh, the, the damaged love map and what way is damaged in this way. So uh, these so one the last group is uh, exhibitionists, uh, exhibitionists and voyeurism. Now, what's going on here? The exhibitionist is locked in foreplay. The voyeur is locked in foreplay. Foreplay precedes intercourse, and uh, but but these people become orgasmic in association with that aspect of foreplay called exhibition because part of sex, having sex, would be you know exhibiting each other to to, to each other or uh, seeing each other. Um, so uh, and it's not so uncommon. Uh, the, the those two problems, fracturism, not so uncommon, not uncommon either. That's just where. The genitals are pressed on another in a crowd, and touches them, or fingers used to touch sex organ, organism, sexual organs in an unobtrusive way. Uh, so, an allure, the last one, means attracting an audience while engaged in sex or being photographed having sex, sex, sex in public. <laughs> that would be that. So, um, that we talked about hyposexuality, hyper, no, excuse me, we talked about paraphilias and hypersexuality. Most of our patients are in these categories. Masturbation to fantasy images, chat rooms, simultaneous repeated affairs, partner sexualization, multiple anonymous affairs. These, these are most of our patients are fit in this category. And <laughs> uh, many of these people are alcoholics and addicts. I don't know how you, uh, how about Justin, what about in your practice here at uh, Williamsburg Place? Do you run into people with problems like these? Yeah, I think fairly consistently there's a sexual aspect of what goes on. I mean, Certainly not everybody, but there yeah. are a lot of folks that do have kind of the comorbidity of things going on. Yeah. We do see it and go into the history further. You do start to see some of the distorted uh, experiences in childhood. And yeah. is, this, is this helping you? Yes. I mean, it's, <laughs> some of it is new. I used to do a sex addiction group up here. Oh, here at Williamsburg yeah. Place. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and then it ran its course. I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Hyposexuality, we yeah. mentioned that earlier. The sec oh, what, oh, sometimes our patients, hypersexual, become uh, hyposexual. And, uh, and, and, and as they start, we start on treatment, then they, they become swearing, they swear, then they swear off all sex. 
and then you can't help them. What's the problem? No sex. So what? You know. But but of course it's very it is a problem. <laughs> but it's very difficult to to get to get to those patients who are high, high, that way. Right. Uh, now this is uh, I guess we'll uh, we better take a it's 10:05. We'll take a break right now for five minutes. Okay. And then you can then we'll pick up. The next uh, slide here talks about disclosure. And what we mean by disclosure is that when we have a patient who is identified as a sex addict, has a sexual compulsion, then uh, they, they usually are hiding their behavior from their loved ones, especially if they're married or have a partner. So we, have the, we do what's called a formal disclosure. What needs to happen is that the, the uh, partner needs to hear they don't need to know what carrot color fingernail polish the, 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 uh, the addict's partner had, but they need to know about their frequency and patterns. And that's what we work on. And so we do, that's all not done at once. What we do is we meet our pay, 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 get to know the patient, get to know them for a while, and then when they are, then maybe it take a month or so, then we'll have a call a formal disclosure where we'll have the patient will write up a disclosure statement about what behavior he did had and then we'll go over that in the office and then we'll meet with the spouse and the patient and do the formal disclosure did you have a disclosure with your spouse did i yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> was that was that done while you're in treatment but you know um after treatment after I treatment think. okay uh, but well she more divorced me while I was in treatment. So yeah. anyway, it, that we got back after that. But um, yeah, and I made a full disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of have to do that. Yeah. And, and it's hard, and of course, it makes her mad as hell and all that. But <laughs> it's the best thing I ever did yeah. in the long run. You just got to live through that yes, early period. You know? Justin? When in the context of recovery does this occur? So I'm thinking kind of like a night set thing shouldn't happen too early on, and nope. this feels sort of like that. You know, I'd have to get a handle on it. Uh, we have to. What we do, we tell, we meet with the partners and, and the patient, and we'll say, "This is what. This is the process. Get the person, get into recovery, get an SAA, get into group therapy, and then we will have the. We will do the full disclosure." Good yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I know that in, in certain paraphilias. That, that people, um, it's almost like they get that re you, euphoric recall and kind of seeing, especially if they victimized other people. So this, I take this as something completely different. Yeah, well, we, sure. We, we, the, the, uh, what she's saying is that when we see this all of all our patients is they, and all, of course, all addiction too. You do it within, within drug addiction, euphoric recall. Euphoric recall applies there too. But what you want to do, you don't want the trauma that they're reviewing to be promote your, your, your euphoric recall. This is why we also want our patients to have a sponsor before they do that too. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it, it, it's a process, it's a really important, you can know it's a really important process for a for, so in other words, it's put, put the, 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 the addiction behind them for the patient and the, and the spouse and partner. Now the next, uh, also it's a good book, Disclosing Secrets by Coraline Schneider. We have our, we use that book, we have our patients use the book because it helps to go through it. Now not only disclosure sometimes is also necessary, suppose uh, a, a man has, a, a, has adult children or teenage children, often the disclosure is needed there too. Yes, in the back. I know that some, well not some, I'm going to use the name, um, Dr. Doug Weiss does. Doug Weiss, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. Does uh, <coughs> polygraphs. Polygraph. Mm -hmm. With his client. Right. Do you all do that? Or what is That's your really a good thought? question. I don't, <laughs> pretty much. I don't either. No. Uh, that, 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 it's, it's, it can be fraught with, it's a very sensitive thing, but it can be fraught with a lot of danger. Because oftentimes it puts, the, it only sometimes heightens the codependency for the spouse. And yeah. because, they, so it gives, gives them this power idea. And then, and, then, and then every month or so, hey, you need a polygraph. And send you off for a polygraph. And the other thing is, you know, the polygraphs are not are fraught Perfect. with danger because of false positives and false negatives. Yeah. So for those reasons, I don't use them. But I, Doug yeah. Weiss does and has an integral part of his therapy. He's in Colorado. And does uh, he's written a lot. He has had some good writings too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, next is the intimacy block. <laughs> we alluded to that earlier. Uh, a really good book on intimacy is this uh, one. We, I use this all the time. This is uh, Carnes as a co-author. It's called Open Hearts. And in here it has the, um, the, the patients. It's, it's, a, it's a couple's workbook. It's for the couples to work, work on, on, on this so laser. Laser, yeah. Right. yeah. And um, uh, in here it has the elements of uh, intimacy. And I listed them here. <laughs> the intimacy has broad dimensions. Uh, nurturance, being present, solicitation, compassion, touch, honesty, accountability, acceptance. And so we, uh, this book here, we address all those. What we do, we have a, a couple's work sheets here where each couple uh, works on each one of those issues uh, in this book and they grade each other the pair the couples grade each other so they can see where they stand it's especially good for the partner to grade the our, the, our patient and the partner because they get a better understanding of it but this is an integral part of our treatment but it doesn't sometimes it maybe take a year before we get to this because uh but but i mean it is something very important uh yeah it's yeah it, sexual addiction is the intimacy block <clears throat> now this is i think a really a good um, picture about courtship. Now we talk, you know, there's sex education. Now we're talking about courtship education. This is something which doesn't take place, I don't think, you know. And this is Carnes' approach to it. And uh, on the left, on the on the left side, noticing attraction, flirtation, demonstration. Now that's how. Uh, do you know the word limerence? Anybody know limerence? Limerence is that excitement that one gets and associated with, 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 with a person of the opposite, if you're heterosexual, the person of the opposite sex. You know, it, 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 you all, I'm sure most of you experienced it. You know, in dating when you're, when you're young and teenage or all, you get, so, you get that excitement. You light up. You light up <laughs> when you're in the presence of someone who's attractive to you, you know. So yeah. that's part of the noticing attraction flirtation. Demonstration is demonstrating something important about that you think would be to sell yourself, you know, some a trait that you may have that may. And then romance is pretty obvious. Individuation, individuation is uh, a little bit like this. Suppose I uh, have a partner and she says, and I, I, I'm a champion bowler and I love bowling. She said, I hate bowling. <laughs> And I don't want to ever be around a bully. Those bowling alleys turn me off on and on. So then I have to decide, what am I going to do? Is it, is it the spouse, is it the girl, or is it the bowling? <laughs> uh, but in other words, so, so some things we shouldn't, we shouldn't give up altogether. Uh, I'm not that, you know, because, ju just, just because uh, our partners think they can't live without them. But anyway, so individuation, you don't want, in other words, you don't want to give all your personality up to be molded by someone else entirely, you know, for example. Intimacy, of course, we talked about that a minute ago. That's, that, that's of course, I say intimacy is being known fully and staying anyway. You know, if you're a healthy relationship, the person will stick, will stick with you in spite of some foibles. I won't tell you what happened in my house this morning. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you. We have foibles? <laughs> so I set the alarm to get up this morning. And uh, so I forgot to turn it off. So of course, who'd awake woke, woke my mother. But for she, she it was good. We, we had, we, intimacy worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, this is little examples, you know. Touching is now. This is the normal reaction: touching, foreplay, intercourse, commitment, or renewal. This is this. This is now. What? Tell me. You tell me. What does the courtship uh, elements of courtship look like for the sex addict? So any anyone, one one person who wants to stand up? Yeah, go ahead. Intercourse first. Say again. Intercourse is at the beginning. <laughs> wow. <laughs> may, there may be some the noticing. easiest way to it. Uh, there may be yeah. some may be some noticing, but right, you're right. The middle section's missing. Yeah. You know, and, and the and and the the intercourse you see on, on in the movies is all, there's no foreplay. <laughs> It's all, 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 all intercourse. This happens, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so what we do here, part of our work, is to reconstruct the court, the court, the the, uh, the relationship, 
and helping to, to return those sections in the middle which have been missing, you know. So we, of course we don't do that right away. But, uh, but I, I find this to be a useful construct to deal with a relationship. Uh, this is sex addiction therapy. The ideal starts residential treatment, like saying you went out to Del Amo in uh, California. Um, there are, I put down the key, then went to Keystone. Key, Keystone. Then you For went three to Keystone. After yeah. That, yeah. So Keystone is a small program, 12 beds in Chester, Pennsylvania, deals only with sex addiction. And it's, I try to get all my patients to go there if I can. It's a beautiful because, old house. Yeah. I mean, it's it, all, everybody, it's same, everybody lives there. And uh, unless they live in the city or something. Yeah. But um, it was a key place for me. Yeah, oh, I mean, I spent three months there after one month in California. And, yeah. Uh, it's 24 7 treatment. Is it a male? Is it a male? No, they nope. have females at times. No, nope. that's. Female. And yeah. I've had females there to come on, you know, and stuff uh -oh. like that. When, I, <laughs> when you were there? <laughs> well, yeah, but I was there earlier, so I was in a little better place. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so and also, the other one is the Meadows, and where Dr. Carnes is in Arizona. It's very expensive, though. Yeah. And uh, then outpatient therapy, like what we do, plus Sex Addicts Anonymous, we mentioned that, and then spout pa partners to go to codependents. It taught, you know, I, I, I'm a 12 stepper, I'm in uh, Naranon for the families of addicts because I have addiction in my family. And, uh, but you know, you know that we were, we're facing the uh, opiate crisis and has that expanded our membership? No, <laughs> no, it's very, we have a small membership. And the same thing with COSA. Somehow or another, it's just tough to get family members to be, get connected. But it, 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 all, all, your, your wife was connected for many years. She yeah. was, she finally stopped last year. Yeah. And then they talk about the counselors needing special training, and I mentioned Covenant Eyes again. <clears throat> Long after I stopped SA, <laughs> she continued to go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oops, wrong one. Okay. This is a really, um, this is a useful tool in uh, treatment of sex addiction. This is this tool, and there's a pamphlet up there. Some of you may pick it up. The pamphlet is on the three circles. And uh, Saint and I can talk about this. Now, the third, three, three circles. <clears throat> The inner circle is what you're not going to be doing, what sexual activity you're not going to be doing. The middle circle are the triggers that get you moved to the inner circle. The outer circle was where, where you're going to be living, living, living your life. The healthy. The healthy, the healthy life. things to do to prevent you from getting into the... Now, some years ago, my grandson and I were doing collages at the kitchen table <laughs> and with cups and saucers and bowls and all like that. So we were doing this, like then, then the three circles came to me. And do you mind being a volunteer? You want to stand up for a second? And uh, what's your name? Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Sharon, do you see Sharon. this? These are the three, these, these Sharon, are the th sorry. three circles. Now, the, uh, the three circles. So this is the inner circle, the middle circle. Do you see any outer circle there? I do. How, yeah, oh, barely. how much is it? Not much. Barely. <laughs> okay. Well, barely. This is the patient at the beginning, <laughs> you know. Then, then what happens is, as, as, the, as the story unfolds is that then, why don't you hold this up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they gradually, oh, you can pass it over to the yeah. And then you, and then me. Okay, and then, so, so this, is, this, this is the, okay, we got the process of recovery now. It's bigger. Moving from <laughs> here to here. So what happens is what recovery is expanding the outer circle. And so this, in SAA, they talk living in the outer circle. When they're living in the outer circle, they're, if they're making friends, they're no longer isolated, they, they've, uh, they go to meetings, they uh, you know, improve their family life and work and everything else. Uh, so what about this one here? That's God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, with this, this is such a, such a useful construct to use with, and you probably could use it with other addiction as well, you know, is to, okay. is, is to uh, uh, see that. Well, thanks a lot, Sherry. You're welcome. Thank you. So, um, so that's a u that useful tool. Okay. <laughs> Victim empathy, another topic that we work on. Uh, and this is, this is to, uh, to patients to become, to identify, this is again, some of this you can't do right away, it takes a little while. But with victim empathy, we're looking for uh, patients to uh, acknowledge uh, who they've wounded. 
And of course, a lot of this can fit into the 12 steps with step eight and nine, you know, where you're making amends to, uh, uh, so that, that the victim empathy is, is uh, uh, say, notab noticeably absent. Uh, the empathy needs not only to uh, consider the people they've, Sorry, 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 easy to see they've hurt, you know, the spouses and family members, but also victim empathy. How about for all those people who are on the internet? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. So, a person with a porn addiction, yes. how does it take over their life? Because, I mean, what are you doing? You're watching porn all day. It's, yeah. I mean, oh, I just need yes. to have a better understanding. Well, the, the, the problem is, is the, uh, remember we talked about uh, fantasy, fantasy and obsession and then sex act? Well, the sex act is masturbation. But at what happens with people, the more they watch, the, the more difficult it is to have an orgasm, but they don't stop. And so they have to get more and more, they keep being be more and more involved whereby they can become yeah. orgasmic. That's, that's one thing. And also, uh, the, uh, the, the addiction, you're looking for this to make sense, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no. It doesn't make sense. Yes. I was at the last SASH conference that was at um, Foundation, and one of the things that I found out, and they gave me several posters so that I could post them at work, one of them was showing that men between the ages of 17 and 24 that were addicted to internet pornography were not able to get an erection or copulate and normally with a woman because they had become so addicted to pornography that's the only way they could get an erection or orgasm so when they were actually in the position to have sex with a real woman couldn't get, couldn't get an erection because they were so conditioned to the pornography it's like a demon's taken over where normal yeah. life is gone you know, and then, and then because we have patients spent hours and hours up all night, you know, all, with, with looking at Whenever pornography. Whenever they think they can get away with it and their wife doesn't know about it. Yeah, right. Whoever, sneak it, sneak. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but empathy is important. And the other thing, working on sexual objectification. Our patients work, in, in SAA they talk about the three second rule, not to a gaze that a woman say more than three seconds. But you know, I, I looked at my wife, three seconds, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so now it, it, it has to be, I think it has to be, that may be a little more than, less than three seconds. And uh, yes, go ahead. Do women and men um, addicts usually find each other? Or are they oh. out with the general oh. population? Oh, often. That's very often. Where the, where the, 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 right. And I see that a lot of a patient now who just cannot. He's been married three times to these these uh, outrageous women, you know, who are just nonstop sex all the time. They, you know, they dash through the door, sex right away, and stuff like that. Well, yeah. I, even though that's true, it's the minority of, I would say the minority of people they get involved with. Oh, well, yeah. sure. It's not, not, it, it does not, happen, though, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Have you done any studies on sex trafficking and sex addiction no. and the uh, comparison? No, that, that's, a, that's a whole other issue. That's, see, this is why we need more of you to be, get involved. <laughs> because, <laughs> because there's just so, they, they, this, this is enormous, the, the, the uh, work that needs to be done. Yeah, we'd like to know more about that. And I said here, sexual objective, the most addict victimized in childhood. I've emphasized that several times. Female sex, we talked a little bit about that. There is a group called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, not here, however, but in other, other communities, especially in Pennsylvania and New England, uh, is the... Uh, is there not one? No, oh, not here, no. There used to be one in Portsmouth, that, yeah, but, no. which is more favorable to women. Women are more comfortable there. Yeah. Uh, Although the women do come. We've had five women at SAA meeting when I went yeah. to them. Yeah. This is, I, I just, we just, Saint and I just Up distributed this, this, uh, this, uh, this set, our little card, okay? The sexual recovery scale. Now, this sexual recovery scale. This is this is a more detailed one. You have you spiritual have one. Recovery. Yeah, spiritual, spiritual recovery you, scale. Yeah. I'm sorry, spirit. Thank you, Saint. <laughs> spiritual recovery scale. Now, this is one we've been using in our office, and Saint and I worked on developing it. And uh, th how this came about is that when people come to group, then they have to check into the group how they're doing physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When they got the spiritually, they'd say, well, I'm going to church and not going to church, or praying or not praying. So 
I would, I would say, well, that's one way perhaps to get there, but I want, I want words we can use to describe what spiritual recovery looks at, something we can hang our hat on. And these are the words. <laughs> uh, on, uh, now, this is expanded from here, and we'll go the, over the one on the, on, the, on the screen. Control to surrender. Now, I know Saint, uh, when he was writing this up, said the control involves secrecy and dishonesty in the control side. Uh, control to surrender. Now, surrender is giving up trying to, to do it on your own, let other people help you, and also to look for, look for, for some spiritual healing. Uh, and actually, unless you can move in that direction from the control to surrender, there's not much you can do with the rest. So we're looking for our patients to move to the surrender side, getting a sponsor, you know, uh, having, have, have, having some belief that the recovery program can be helpful to them. And maybe have, and a therapist, maybe perhaps. A, a, yeah, a therapist as well, right. <coughs> the next is self-blame. Uh, everyone comes with self-blame. They, you know, they're not able to see that this is a disease. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that because the disease prevents them from seeing that it's a disease. Self-blame to self-acceptance. Self -blame, this is an illness. Well, I like the root word of disease, dis Ease. D I S E A S E. You know, you're, you're doing something, but you don't feel it's not. You know, it's not right. Yeah. So it's dis ease. It's dis -ease. Yeah. <clears throat> Next is uh, self pity, or that people feeling sorry for themselves. The whiners. Some of you are twelve steppers. Hear the whining at the meetings, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, this is oftentimes the the person locked in self pity. The opposite here is gratitude. Uh, th these words and this organization is not particular just to Saint and I because the book called The Spirituality of Imperfection by Kurtz and Ketchum, if you don't know it's a great book because yeah. it, it deals with these issues. Uh, next is loneliness or isolation, moving to friendship and solitude. Uh, In other words, loneliness doesn't just mean being alone because solitude is good if you feel good alone. Yeah. Solitude is being alone to meditate. Yeah. yeah. To, 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 uh, that, that's, that's healthy, healthy aloneness right. is, is a solitude. Uh, and it fits in with the 11th step, sought, you know, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. What's the name of that book again? Spirituality. spirituality of Imperfection. This is, you know, seeing the world as the opposite. <laughs> so I, I had an interesting experience here at Patrick Henry Airport. I uh, went down to uh, Atlanta to go to a conference on a friend of mine was doing on uh, uh, counselor ethics and counseling. Just a day. I was going down at 6 o'clock in the morning, come back at 5 o'clock at night. So I got on the plane. I had some AA literature. And I'm reading it. And the flight attendant comes by. Oh, he says, a friend of Bill W. I said, oh, no, no, Lois, his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so so any, anyway, uh, anyway, she says she was in, she was in Al-Anon also. And so um, we, she didn't have much time to talk. I told her to go into the conference and all. And so she said, goodbye. So, so then uh, when I was going, coming back at uh, 5 o'clock, I was uh, waiting in, as, in, in the airport. And here she comes by, now no longer in her flight attendant uniform, but regular clothes. And she says she was on her way down. She's an older lady. She's, she had eight, eight children, in fact. And she said that she was on her way down to visit her uh, mother in Gulfport. And so I, I was reading The Spirituality of Imperfection. And so uh, the topic happened to be on God's grace. <laughs> she said, oh, God's grace. I never thought it was available to me. I never thought I was worthy. But my sponsor says, sure you are. Changed my life. Off she went. I said, wow, what a beautiful, ac beautiful accidental encounter. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, uh, oh, another thing is on this side here, well, our patients, we have this on the board in the office. And, and, when, and when they uh, come in, I would take them up and we'll show this and let them know what this is about. And I remember the other day we had a guy come in and he says, I said, where are you on the scale? He says, well, I'm out in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 so, so anyway, <laughs> so, so this, and, this is, and this is now we do with all the check-ins, we do this. Next is resentment to forgiveness, big step. And that's why resentment is down lower in the list. <laughs> And then indignation. Now, this is really important, indignation. We see it all the time. Uh, indignation is when we're doing that initial assessment. Somebody's dragged the patient in, 
And of course he wasn't on the computer. Of course he wasn't having these affairs. And he, he was mad. Uh, he was really <laughs> mad. He was stormy, you know. And so uh, indignation, you all probably see it in your work in, in uh, substance abuse as well. So uh, uh, our patients now use this as a, as a check on themselves. If they find themselves becoming indignant, they're, they're not in a healthy space. And uh, this, then, then they need, need to move to move the remorse. A false pray to humility. Now the, the, sec, the, li, the list on the left is based in fear and shame. The right is love and serenity. Now I don't think you all, any, anyone could deny this is good stuff. <laughs> this stuff right here is available in 12-step programs <laughs> and also through the counseling. And this is why I think, I, okay, if you, if you, there's a whole community of sex offenders therapists. Any sex offenders therapists here? Yes. Tell us about how, 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 what you're thinking about now as we're talking about this, because most times in sex offender therapy, it's more control. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's an element of probation and polygraphs and um, that kind of involvement that's um, not really there in the resistance. Oh, could you stand up a little bit and we could hear you better? You don't mind? And well, your name. Oh, my name is Ricky Jones. Hi. I'm a certified sex care treatment provider. I worked um, in a private practice for about two and a half years in Norfolk, uh, specifically with sex offenders who were ordered to treatment um, by their probation officer. Uh -huh. um, and so I use elements of polygraphs every six months. Um, what, else, what else would you like to know? What's that? What else would you like to know? Oh, no, that's all. So in other words, I'm just thinking, I don't, again, I don't know a whole lot about your work other than think that it involves more control than surrender. You know, the surrender being the higher power in 12-step programs and things like that. Um, well, there's definitely not an involved, like the, a 12-step approach. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of empathy-based work, a lot like a victim impact statement. <laughs> um, that's similar to what we do, yeah. Um, Like what? Covert sensitization. What's that? Um, so using a um, teaching them to connect the consequences of their crime with the the enjoyment of the crime. So oh, okay. They, um, they sort of pair together in the brain, so then when they have those thoughts again, they automatically think of the consequences. Sure. Yeah, as you're talking, it sounds like to me like we, we all need to talk more. The two communities need to talk more. Yeah. I think so, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, what do you think about this scale? I, I think it's very helpful. We've just spent a lot of time, what you would call indignation. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time focusing on that and cognitive distortions, the things they use to protect themselves. Cognitive distortions, yeah, yes. Uh, uh -huh. teaching them statements to um, challenge them themselves. That's a lot of the work right there is just challenging yeah. what they're telling themselves to make their events okay. Too bad we didn't have the parentheses at the end on this. Oh, the I, lo I love that. It just Oh, the parenthesis based in fear and shame yeah. on one side and then based yeah. on love and serenity. This is a work in progress. It's been going on now for how many years? About 12 years. Oh, at least. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so any, any feedback you can give us, is we, we, we appreciate it. Let's see, where are we now? Uh, oh, indignation, we got that. And then, uh, well, gee, we're just, we're just about finished up. Um, the um, next slides just have to do with the, uh, and I did with it. Oh, here it is, right here. The next two slides are just the, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, indignation. Now, a little elaboration on indignation. Have you all seen the, uh, R. Kelly. Every a lot of people nodding in oh, your head. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just thinking about R. Kelly. So R. 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 Kelly, uh, if you don't know, is, is a rapper. He's in famous. He's involved in a lot of sexual in, in, um, uh, impropriety. Uh, maybe I think he's been arrested or he's been on trial and stuff like that. But what happened in the tape is the fact that he, he is, uh, uh, it, everything is turned around. 
for by then he becomes blaming, then he starts blaming the victims. Uh, I saw this recently, and my wife was watching this show called Happy Valley. It's, a, from, it's about a police, police woman in, in, uh, in Britain, and uh, where this guy, and it's a crime story, and this guy is a, an accountant in the office, and he and wants to get extra money so he can send his kids to private school. So he's uh, going to the uh, boss and trying to get some money, and he, really, he doesn't think the boss is going to give him money. So he ends up getting get, linking with these gangsters, and they abduct the boss's daughter. <laughs> so anyway, the whole story ends up with the guy. He goes to the accountant's in jail. So the boss goes to meet the accountant in jail. So the accountant's sitting there. The accountant's sitting there. Well, this is, he's, he's blaming the boss because if the boss had given him a rise raise before, none of this would have happened. In other words, this is the victim. That happens a lot. It's called DARVO, D-A-R-V-O. Denial, attack the accuser, reverse victim and offender. <laughs> So uh, th this, this is, a, this, this is a, a pattern. If we have patients, I have patients who come in this manner, then we can't treat them. I mean, there's no way that you can get to people like this, you know, who are, who are into bl blaming their spouses, say, for, the, for, 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 for not giving them sex, perhaps. You know, something like that, which is, when the, uh, the, so. And I put the, the cases of R. Kelly and Judge Kavanaugh, who was indignant uh, before the Congress. I said, we cannot set or blame God no sex addiction for what we hear in the news, because we can't tell them what people are, but, but you want to be alert. Any, anybody uh, uh, can relate to this? This, uh, yes, can you comment on it? Well, I was actually thinking more, I do a relapse prevention group for uh -huh. um, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction. And that, that's often what I encounter, you know, where it's like, okay, engage the person, but if they're pre contemplative and having this, you know, the indignation, which is thinking of a client who finished the other day, and it's like, how much do I confront that, or oh, you yes. just let them, because you really can't, it's kind of what you just said. So, I don't know, what's, what's most effective? So well, I have a range of folks that work with as far as yes. patients. I like the way you link that with pre-contemplative. You know, because when indignant, that's right, there's no way you can, no way you can get to these folks, they're walled off, you know, and, uh, uh, so, and it's good, it's good to step aside in cases like that. But this is something, something we see. Um, uh, see, I think that pretty well covers most everything. Now, um, I listed here useful references, and now those are the books we have front. Uh, oh, also one more thing I forgot. We, I, I, all, we also, uh, when we when we were doing the uh, spread around, when we passed around the little cards with spiritual recovery scale. This, this work is from, from a, uh, Dr. St. George's book, uh, his book here, Light in the Darkness, your book. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, did you bring books? To, I did, yeah, I bring some, brought some. They're $20 a piece. $20 a piece. Uh, they you, give you my you, story and then you, uh, alphabetically gives a lot of. Th this is, th we use this a lot for our patients because in this book, he has alphabetized all the important topics <laughs> that relate to sex addiction recovery. And uh, so, uh, anyway, so I had given to you here, uh, this is like a companion to our spiritual recovery scale, because in his book, and you can, why don't you talk about this, about the contrasting th things there. Well, here's um, what's below the surface. You see the water going along. For the, um, the addictive behavior, you have Anger, blame, which is projected self-hatred. Shame, which is self-hatred. Resentment, and seeing self as a victim. It's all fear-based. You get into recovery, uh, you, you then have, should put you in a loving position. You develop serenity, acceptance of others, acceptance of yourself, and joy. And that's a pretty simple, um, description, but that's just, this is the water, you know. What's, what's above the water, is, what you can see is the addictive behavior and then the recovery. That's, he, St. George Lee came up this sort of independently, and then we, then we had the spiritual recovery scale, we worked on that together. So, uh, but you see the same, the, the, this is the same course like you see in the spiritual recovery scale, the contrasting items here. Um, and uh, one thing I'll say is uh, about this, uh, being on the, 
r right side is, uh, is uh, j just like we talked about addiction being progressive and predictable, recovery is re pro progressive and predictable also. If you're working a recovery program and you're living on the right side, you know, growth in that area is unavoidable. You, sorry, can't avoid it. <laughs> you're going to get better and better as, you know, as time goes on. Yeah, you sure will. Good. Well, thanks for your attention. Yes, go ahead in the back. No, it's a difficult thing. You can't sort it all out. Sometimes, of course, people are indignant because they they're actually did not innocent. Do, 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 innocent, right. But, but, but Oh, of course we don't know. No, we don't know where the, where the truth of it is. But, the, but, the, but you, whatever I see indignation, uh, worries me. <laughs> More often than not, it's 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 the it's it's the person who's been being being accused accused of something they actually did, rather than falsely accused. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Can you speak a little bit to or um, provide some resources? Who's, who's? You have to stand up and show sure Yeah, yeah. I, I work a lot with college students yeah. and young adults, and so one thing mm -hmm. that we have to discuss or talk about is the use of apps, Bumble, Tinder, oh, and yeah. so when I look at Karn's elements of courtship, um, young adults in their healthy sexuality or healthier sexuality or where they currently are don't see it as a problem. They don't even have that center section at all. That's, that's center Today. 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 Yeah. So I'm curious, who would you recommend as far as that's, that's doing studies or looking at 21st century, looking at young adults or even children in middle school right now that are coming up with access to pornography on the school bus? Right, I mean, we're talking about there's like this is really great information, but I think there's a whole additional resource pocket that we need mm -hmm. for for as parents raising children, but also working in the schools. There's school counselors in the room, um, and but also looking at college students because I I can't I was in my head thinking I I can't think of a single client I have right now that doesn't go about meeting people that's not online. That's not online. That's not oh, online. Oh, that, that is how you. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and that's not, I don't know, so right. <laughs> right, yes, so so like you're right. And, you know, when we talk about the courtship, or I'll, I'll bring up that, they look at me like, how old are you? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's not, like, I'm not going to go into a coffee shop and talk to someone. I mean, they're all using apps. Active, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. This, 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 certainly, the, you know, this is, as I said, when we first started, we, this, 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 the spectrum's pretty broad. Right. And, and the uh, Im impact uh, na nationwide, worldwide now with right. this is really powerful. Uh, so join the club, join SASH, come on and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and start, start, yeah. to, to get, start doing some research, you know, yeah. uh, because uh, you, you're, you're right. I, 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 well, I can find out. If you give me your card afterwards, yeah. I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, so did we cover all the, uh, yeah, I think we covered Who those two. Who specifically are looking for what? Oh. For the. Well, I kind of agree with her. Like, nowadays, people don't have courtship like you used to. You don't meet someone. Oh, yeah. Take. Now yeah. it's more like the apps. You swipe left, you slap, swipe right. They look, and that's how everybody's meeting people now. So Online? Kind of online, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. my question would be just, does that? Yeah. I think it's, it's more. Yeah. That, that, that starts out more than that. Plus. <laughs> so. Really? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I can see that, but um, you're right. That's not the best way to meet people. Right. <laughs> uh, this like, this is another like quite real one thing I d d m m forgot to mention um, <clears throat> is uh, we talked about book ending eroticized right? erotic justice. Erotic justice is. Um, um, a, li a little bit is is uh, uh, acknowledging healthy um, the orgasm, a healthy relationship, healthy orgasm. Now, erotic justice is not being met by uh, immigrants coming as domestic workers from another country, coming to this country, say, uh, because they they leave the sex behind. 
you know, in, not, in the uh, mid 1800s, they built the railroad across the United States, and the western start, the western part of the railroad was built by Chinese workers. They brought them from China, but they only came; they're all males. Then they had to bring prostitutes over for them. I mean, there's this no no erotic justice, you know. So we have to think 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 like this. I don't know where erotic justice fits in what you're all talking about too, because uh, you know because it, it, romance doesn't exist. Yeah, or if it does, it's accidental. Well, yeah. or or it could happen, I guess. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank yeah. you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>